Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we continue to get perspectives on the war in Ukraine. My guest for today is Vijay Prashad. Vijay Prashad is the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. It describes itself as an international movement-driven institution focused on stimulating intellectual debate that serves people's aspirations. He is the author of such books as The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, and The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. He has a couple of pieces out about the war, one you can find in his newsletter that you can read at the tricontinental.org. He also has an op-ed out for South African newspaper Mel and Guardian called Ukraine a conflict soaked in contradictions. Vijay Prashad, it's a great pleasure, sir, to welcome you back to this radio program. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Great to be with you. How do you view this war in Ukraine? What lens are you seeing it through? It's complicated because all wars are ugly and have a criminal aspect to them. Um, obviously, when the sovereignty of a, of a country is violated, it's of concern. I mean, you know, I'm a great a champion of the U United Nations Charter and certainly crossing the borders of a country, uh, you know, into the sovereign space of another country, that's a violation of the UN Charter. So that's very chilling. But as I said, there's a human aspect to this. Nobody wants to see people fleeing from, you know, for their lives. Uh, nobody wants to see buildings and homes and so on destroyed. Um, war is an ugly matter. On the other hand, I also uh, understand what's happening a little bit. And, and I want to say, Mitch, right off the bat, you know, I, I've been a, a reporter for a long time. I've reported from difficult places, from Syria, from Iraq, from, um, you know, Libya and so on. Uh, I understand some of the ugliness involved here. But I also want to say that, um, you know, reporters, when we tell stories, we try to explain what's happening. And I think often we get attacked because people assume we're justifying what's happening. Uh, I want to understand what's happening in Ukraine. And I think the room in public discourse for understanding has diminished. I think people want you to take sides and not try to understand or get a grip of what's going on. I mean, here, frankly, uh, you have to understand that there are two origins of this war. One is on the 24th of February 2022, when Russian forces crossed into Ukrainian territory. The other origin of this war is in 2014, uh, when there was a conflict that broke out for a variety of reasons in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine, where there's a majority of Russian speakers. And, and the reason this is important to put on the table is that you know, since 2014, the government in Kiev has pushed an anti-minority line, a line of Ukrainian nationalism, you know, including prohibiting the uh, use in the state of other languages, not only Russian, but also Moldovan, Romanian, Lithuanian, and so on. And also has broken the Kiev church's link to the Church of Moscow, you know, Petro Poroshenko, who was the president of Ukraine from 2014, drove this ultra-nationalist position. And so there are people who say, look, the war didn't begin on the 24th of February 2022, but it began, in fact, in 2014. And I think we need to understand that. that that's the reason there's a conflict here, is that there are people who say there's an ongoing war. There's been 14,000 civilians killed in eastern Ukraine, most of them Russian speakers. And Russia intervened to protect them. Well, that's the complexity of this war. If it was just black do, and do, white, do you it would believe be much that? easier. Do you, do you believe that, that was, that's Russia's motivation to protect the people? I think there are two motivations for the Russians, or maybe three. And let's have all of them on the table. The first is I do think there is a sincere sentiment inside Russia about Russian-speaking people, not only in Ukraine, but this goes back to Georgia in 2008, in South Ossetia and so on. You know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it collapsed in a very interesting way. Um, you know, all the republics basically went on their own. There was no conflict. They became, some of them joined the Commonwealth of Independent States. Eventually, that also collapsed. There was no conflict right after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. In a way, what we are seeing in Georgia in 2008, in Ukraine from 2014 onward is a kind of delayed setting, settling accounts 
with the complexities of the collapse of a political institution like the USSR. You know, it's taken time uh, for some of these cultural issues to actually come to the surface. So one reason why the Russians did intervene, I believe, is because there is a sincere sense of fellowship with Russians in these other places. And in the Duma in Moscow, it wasn't Putin's United Russia that first tabled the motion to support Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, to support their secession. It was actually the Communist Party that first drove it. Eventually, United Russia, feeling the pressure of popular sentiment, went along with it. That's the first thing. Secondly, it's also true that the um, Russians have been concerned that NATO and the United States have been eager to move closer to the Russian border, not merely to set up, you know, alliances with the countries there, but because with the withdrawal by the United States in 2018, in the Intermediate Forces uh, Treaty, you know, the Intermediate Missile Treaty, uh, very important uh, withdrawal by the Trump administration, the INF, when the U.S. government withdrew, there was a serious discussion in Russia that the United States was going to put intermediate missiles into places like Ukraine, which can then, you know, within minutes strike Moscow. That's the second issue. And I think the Russians have been pretty straightforward about saying that's a concern for them. That's why they've been talking about security guarantees. The third thing, Mitch, which I think very few people are talking about, and I don't understand why, you know, when um, the conflict broke out in 2014 in Ukraine, when there was, look, let's call it, it was a coup uh, helped along by Victoria Newland of the, of the administration and United States government. She was there in the Maidan. Her cell phone records were leaked. I mean, it showed the level of U.S. involvement in getting rid of the government of Yanukovych, bringing in uh, first Yats. She kept saying in her phone call, Yats, we want Yats. They got Yats and then Petro Poroshenko. So um, when the Maidan took place and the government of, uh, of Yanukovych was overthrown, at that time, the Russians entered and brought Crimea, seized Crimea. Now, the reason the Russians seized Crimea is in Sevastopol. They have one of the two main warm water ports. The other warm water port is in Latakia, in Tartus, in Syria. So the reason why Russia intervenes militarily to seize Crimea in 2014, and by the way, in Crimea, there was a referendum, even if a referendum has cheating of some level, something like 80 to 90 percent of the population voted to join Russia. I think that's pretty credible that the majority wanted to join Russia. It's a largely Russian speaking area. In 2014, they seized Crimea. In 2015, they entered Syria, both to defend Russia's only two warm water ports. Russia has no other warm water ports for its Navy. This is very significant and I'm surprised. This is not right on the surface of conversation. Well, since Russia took Crimea, it has only been linked to Crimea by a bridge uh, across the Black Sea. And in the last couple of years, the Russian government has been complaining, saying Ukraine has cut off water supplies to Crimea. So Crimea has faced a severe drought and Russia has had to bring water across in tankers along that bridge. If you look at the fighting, it's very clear that the Russians are trying to create a land bridge that goes from the two eastern uh, provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk all the way into Crimea. And that's the third reason I believe they intervened. One, they intervened uh, because of the, uh, the kind of real, you know, ultra-nationalist Nazi type attacks, Nazi attacks on the people, Russian speakers of eastern Ukraine. Secondly, uh, because they do fear the intermediate missiles being placed in places like Ukraine. And third, they want a land bridge to Crimea. That, I think, is, is their basic war aims. And that's what they're going, not going to settle for anything less, it seems. For you, does that justify the invasion? Nothing justifies an invasion because the, the, you know, the suffering is going to be uh, unimaginable. Also, it's going to polarize Ukraine. You know, Ukraine, ultra-nationalists are going to increase their sense of, of, of what you know, Ukraine means to them and so on. The situation in Ukraine will be polarized. I think that's, that's a very bad outcome. I feel like Mr. Putin made a rash decision here. You know, what could have happened? And look, I'm not the head of a big government and so on. You know, who am I? Just a minor intellectual, you know, talking to you on the radio. I, I'm not the head of a government. They have other concerns and worries and so on. I, I, I understand that. 
On the other hand, it is interesting that in the last couple of years, the Russian government has not been able to gain traction either in the UN system, the United Nations system, or in the world media about the atrocities being committed against Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. You know, it's interesting. Uh, if anything like this happened to a U.S. ally, if you know minorities were being discriminated and so on, the United States would have really, you know, played the record over and over again, gone to the UN, sought a Security Council resolution and so on. I'm surprised that the Russian government didn't seek a Security Council resolution. What the Russians could have done is they could have made a dossier of atrocities. You know, the UN accepts that 14,000 civilians were killed in eastern Ukraine since between 2014 and 2020. That's a lot of civilians, Mitch. 50,000 people injured. That's a lot of people. There have been um, busloads of refugees going to Rostov. That's in Russia, crossing the border. Also, Ukrainian speakers going to Kiev, you know, leaving. There's ethnic cleansing happening at a mass scale for the size of Ukraine. I'm afraid that could have been made into a major issue. You know, when uh, Mr. Zelensky, the, the president of Ukraine, announced recently saying, oh, look, you know, I'm a... Um, I'm Jewish of Jewish origin and I'm against the fascists. At that moment, it would have been interesting if Mr. Putin got on a plane, arrived in Kiev and said, let's organize a joint anti-fascist conference called the bluff of the Ukrainian government, which has been operating alongside some of these fascistic groups for the last decade or so. You know, it would have been interesting if he had done that. What I'm trying to say is there were a lot of political maneuvers that needed to be exhausted. I'm one of those people, and I might be naive and idealistic, but I'm one of those people who believes that war is the very, very, very last resort. Everything must be exhausted before you go there. And I, as a you know ordinary intellectual, have given you at least two things that could have been done. Um, you know, and these, by the way, these would have actually assisted the Russian government because it would have prepared international opinion. Uh, it would have prepared people to understand what's happening in eastern Ukraine. But, you know, uh, between the silence of the Western media, which really didn't report this much, even though it was UN reports that were coming out about this violence, Western media didn't report this much between that and between the Russians unable to use international institutions effectively. I think you know those are two options that could have been tried out. Yeah. Do you see Russia as an imperial power? You see, I think Russia is being a defensive power rather than imperial. I already told you, in my opinion, the intervention into Syria and into Crimea at least, but now Ukraine uh, in general, those two interventions are about protecting the Russian Navy. Um, look, on military grounds, the Russians are unwilling to directly confront the United States. Mr. Putin made a very interesting gamble here. He entered Ukraine knowing full well, I think, that nobody else wanted to enter this conflict. You know, I, I saw the clip of Hillary Clinton in very bad taste saying that they're going to convert Ukraine into something like Afghanistan. I thought that's in bad taste. You know, firstly, look at just what happened in Afghanistan. You know, you had to withdraw from there. The Taliban is back in power. Now you presume to arm these Nazi groups in Ukraine, you'll strengthen the Nazi groups all across Eastern Europe. That's hardly got to be comforting to people who have to live with the detritus of that. You know, it's easy enough for Hillary Clinton living in the outskirts of New York City to talk like that. But imagine what this would mean in Croatia and Poland and places where Nazis would now feel completely emboldened and so on. Very disturbing attitude, frankly. Um, so, I mean, I feel like that was a gamble that Mr. Putin took, but it's a gamble again that's against the lives of people in Ukraine. And it's, it's an unfortunate, un very unfortunate gamble against those lives. I mean, I, I'm not sure. You know, I think that currently, um, if these war aims are secured, if the Russians are able to get their land bridge, if they have an agreement, they are negotiating at the Belarus Ukraine border, if, if an agreement is reached, Mr. Trump apparently is going there. The head Ukrainian negotiator announced it on Fox News that Trump is coming with a delegation of Republicans and so on. If some deal is able to be cut, um, you know, it's still not going to bring things to a good place because ultra nationalism has increased in Ukraine and in Russia, great Russian chauvinism has increased. You know, this is 
something that lenin had warned about in the 1920s you know warned about russian chauvinism and that's the reason the ussr was created you know as a way to deal with minority nationalities give them uh, some dignity in in their own republics and so on so that great russian chauvinism doesn't come and and demolish things these are old habits mitch the same thing is there in china there is the great han chauvinism which mao warned about you know in the 1950s and china has to deal with this in india we are dealing with the great hindu chauvinism i mean these old countries are dealing with old chauvinisms and th- this is an old cultural fight that we will have to fight that's the reason why i find a lot of the commentary on this conflict very limited because it's looking at this conflict in a from a liberal lens you know democracy versus non democracy or whatever doesn't understand asia and these parts of the world where there are old ethnic um, you know loyalties and ideas and so on these have to be unraveled they cannot be you know just like treated as as non existent take a look at the united states We're still dealing with the old you know issues of jim crow you know it's not gone away uh, republicans don't want to talk about slavery they are worried about you know what is it they want to ban ethnic studies and ban critical race theory i mean these are old cultural problems the tap root has not been pulled out this is letters in politics and we are in conversation with vijay prashad vijay prashad is the director of the tricontinental institute for social research he has a new piece out in south african newspaper mail and guardian called ukraine a conflict soaked in contradictions. You can also read his writings about many things and other writers, uh, including about the conflict in Ukraine, online at the tricontinental.org. Vijay Prashad, we have had a number of people on over the days talking about the, the war in Ukraine, and we've attempted to bring on differing views about the war on Ukraine. And I want to follow up on what you said concerning the coup, what you call the coup of 2014, and also the idea of of Nazis and and fascist in Ukraine. People that we've talked to, uh, somebody yesterday, I think she would describe herself as a Marxist. Her name is uh, Yulia uh, Yorchenko. Uh, She teaches in England, but she's from Ukraine. She's in Ukraine now. I asked her about both of those things. She's fighting for her home right now in Ukraine. I asked her about both of those things. And on the idea of 2014, which some call the Euromaidan, protest um which you called a coup she said that it's over it's a it's it it, it it it's an oversimplification to call it a coup that there are hundreds of thousands of people that took to the streets in 2014 uh she may not have said this but others have said parliament was on the verge of uh of of impeaching uh the president um yes afterwards you can make an argument it was hijacked by outside forces but that by just calling it a coup you're not giving the ukrainians who rose up in that moment uh, their own agency and their and their own value well look firstly um there are procedures there are laws there's a constitution uh generally when the constitution is flouted you say there was an illegal e- event taking place now i'm in favor of hundreds of thousands of people gathering up and putting their views forward and so on but i'm also very much uh, concerned about the idea that you know we just disregard a constitution let's take the case in bolivia in bolivia in november 2019 there were protests against the government of of evo morales um in fact the police went on strike famously uh, on the other hand mr morales term previous term wasn't going to expire before january of 2020 uh, he was removed forcibly the military came and told him to go he went off to a rural area eventually to mexico and then argentina when mr morales was removed he was removed against the constitution that's a coup you know however you want to call it and anyway i'm not interested in sticking to a big debate about whether it's a coup or it's a popular uprising or whatever the real issue is what happens afterwards it's undeniable that the government of mr petro poroshenko drove a ukrainian ultra nationalist agenda an agenda against minorities it's on the record he says three things have to be established the military the language and religion he says it directly 
he then goes ahead and pushes for a language policy that is basically ukrainian first and and no other language possible it got to such a point that in the hungarian parliament there was a debate about hungarian speaking people in ukraine secondly as i mentioned they broke from the patriarch of of moscow and you know broke the religion connection with moscow that's a huge enormous anti russian policy that mr poroshenko drove what happens in 2014 let's set that aside I, i'm not interested in that debate i mean i'm interested in establishing that from 2014 onwards at least during the administration of petro poroshenko there was an anti russian anti lithuanian anti minority anti roma policy uh, driven by an ultra nationalist agenda that agenda emboldened various nazi like forces i mean you want to or not want to call them nazis they call themselves nazis you know they call themselves fascists they are not the azov battalion people are not you know they are not sitting around saying you know we are nice liberals these are fascistic people um, and they get emboldened after 2015 and there about 2014 and enter the conflict as militia groups um in eastern ukraine basically going after russian speakers and it's at that point that the real clash breaks out that leads to the minks agreements i mean the minks agreements happened you know we know they happened they happened in two bouts they happened in the capital of belarus that's undeniable why was there the minks agreement you don't have an agreement if you don't have a problem well what was the problem the problem was a conflict in donets and luhansk that's a problem what was the problem there the problem there was that russian speakers felt that they were being oppressed um, and then these battalions came in fascistic battalions you don't want to call them nazis they are fascistic at least they entered and there was violence 14000 civilians died that's a problem now again you know i understand of course it's terrible to face an invasion by a country like you know russia is invading ukraine i understand that it's terrible it's appalling i condemn the invasion but i i don't want to at the same time rewrite history and pretend that you know everything was great until the 24th of february when the russians intervened which i mean an act of rewriting history is uncalled for 14000 civilians died there you know let's not forget them it's the same way in which people talk about say the war in syria you know uh, whatever your position on the war in syria it is undeniable that the government of syria in 2011 crack down viciously against protesters killed children in the streets of dara that actually happened you know i was in beirut i covered some of that stuff that happened now the fact is that then the west comes in and starts funding and supporting al qaeda groups literally al qaeda groups jabhat al nusra and so on that become isis the west the turks the gulf arabs support them and then the battle is be- between al qaeda and the syrian government well that's a uh, different question that doesn't mean that the original violence didn't take place in dara you know in in 2011 it's the same here you know there was an original violence it took place in donets and luhansk you can't deny that whether it's a coup or it's some sort of extra parliamentary measure that took place in 24 it brought to bear a government that allowed this stuff to happen and that's where we are now it didn't start because putin woke up one day and said i want to seize ukraine I mean I'm no fan of Mr Putin on the other hand I don't think we should fantasize about what's going on do you see parallels between Syria and, and Ukraine and and I mean geopolitically but I also mean I guess the discourse that we have on the left about these two wars of course there are parallels and the funny thing is the same people are on different sides of of these wars yeah, you know that's what I was thinking yeah no it's exactly let's take the case of Libya for a second because it's interesting in libya in the eastern part striking it's the east that's why i want to take the libya example memo jibril who used to be the chief financial advisor of the uh, wife of the, the then emir of qatar um who was working with gaddafi's government arrived in benghazi and declared that the east was under an Im- immense attack from the west genocide was you know on the horizon he used his contacts in the gulf arab states to basically drum up the idea that they were all going to be slaughtered um okay that's very similar to what the people in donets and luhansk has, have been saying since 2014 with the one difference 
is that we have evidence of 14,000 people killed in in eastern Ukraine in Libya when Mr. Jibril was saying that the death rate was nowhere as high, but also it was not over the course of eight years. You know, it it was just in a few weeks that he said that. In a few weeks, the assumption that there might be genocidal killing was utilized by the United States and France. to push through a un security council resolution first 2011 then uh, no sorry first 1970 resolution 1970 and then resolution 1973 and then they started bombing eastern uh, the western libya tripoli and and the site now they violated the un resolution immediately un resolution said create a no fly zone protect eastern libya no they started operating as the air force of the rebels in the east is russia doing that are they operating as, i don't think so i think they are playing a different game they are not seeking to conquer all of ukraine i don't think so i think even though the troops coming down from belarus there are troops in kiev and so on i think the war aims are much more limited seizing the eastern part and creating the land bridge to crimea perhaps taking the town of chernobyl and other nuclear sites maybe i don't know exactly what they have in mind but certainly i don't think they are under any illusion that they are going to come and seize um, kiev and rule over all of ukraine still it's a parallel the, the same people now the kind of you know left liberals and so on who in the libyan conflict were cheering on nato cheering it on as it destroyed libya are in this case saying oh my god it's a terrible war we stand with the ukrainians we're going to fly yellow and blue flags on on the the on facebook and so on i challenge people what was the color of the libyan flag in fact let me ask people this your listeners uh, mitch because they've been flying yellow and blue flags on their social media what's the color of the flag of the democratic republic of the congo where millions of people have died since the first great lakes war began in 1995 96 what's the what does the flag of the democratic republic of the congo look like and if you don't care what that flag looks like then there is an international division of humanity then there are some people whose lives matter and others whose lives just don't matter this is the main point of the article that you wrote in the mill and guardian the south african newspaper called ukraine a conflict soaked in contradictions you write this quote no one which is to say the political forces in the north atlantic states care about the suffering of children in Africa and Asia they are however gripped by the war in Ukraine which should grip them which distresses all of us but which should not be allowed to be seen as worse than any other conflicts taking place across the globe i mean this is such an obvious point you know it's being made all over the place in the parliament in ireland a parliamentarian stood up and he said you know you so easily condemn the russians and the but you won't say anything about israel you know you won't talk about gaza what about those children you know and ironically one of the social media memes that circulated the most was a young girl blonde girl confronting a soldier and it circulated on youtube tiktok all over the place with a thing saying little ukrainian girl you know talks back to a russian soldier you know that girl was not ukrainian that girl was ahed tamimi age 11 Uh, a palestinian, palestinian girl, girl just happens to have blonde hair confronting an israeli soldier how interesting that you can use a little video from palestine to talk about ukraine but you won't talk about palestine itself this is such an obvious point you know when reporters come and talk about children with blue eyes and blonde hair and then they say things like kiev is not a city like baghdad i mean this is the hidden transcript of western journalists you know this is what people must be thinking in that people like me you know who talk to gen western journalists in cities like baghdad and beirut and so on you know i know underneath they believe that these are barbaric places i'm i'm sorry to say so met some charming lovely people and so on but i know that there's a hidden transcript there that somehow you know it's terrible what's happening over here but i mean their idea of life is different and so on there is something there i've always felt it and this is confirmed it you know cbs reporter on air says that look i mean there's some he says he, he says himself i'm not don't know how to put this he says he i don't know how to put, he knows he's saying something horrible but he's saying basically kiev cannot afford it should never be bombed whereas you know 
Kabul, that's a city that you just keep bombing and has been bombed for time immemorial. I mean, this poor guy, you know, firstly, his clip goes viral. Then he apologizes. But Mitch, he's back on air the next day. Okay. There's no canceling of him. It's really interesting. You know, um, high officials saying the same thing. You know, in fact, this is not just statements. It's government policy. The government of Poland, which you know, used armed force against Syrian families, preventing them entering the country, welcoming in Ukrainians and stopping at the border, African students, Indian students and others saying you are not welcome here. Wow. It's basically it's global racism in front of our eyes. It's what I think of as the international division of humanity. That's what we're living in. We, there is an international division of humanity. The sooner we actually admit to it, uh, the faster we'll be able to confront it. Because if we deny it, if we deny it, if we believe there's a kind of you know liberalism everywhere, you're not going to be able to change the world. Liberalism is skin deep. And I use the word skin deliberately. Do you think with this war now in Ukraine and the responses to the world to the war, including from the United States and in the West, does this change geopolitics? going forward? It's an excellent question. Um, it's an excellent question. And I really don't know the answer to that. I don't want to be too flippant and too certain about what's happening. Certainly, it feels, Mitch, like something has changed. And I think we should all take a deep breath of, you know, that, that sense that something has changed. Well, what has changed? You know, um, this intervention by Russia in Syria in 2015, that was extraordinary because the Russians basically created a shield against the United States coming in and bombing um, Damascus. I, I remember that. I remember sitting in Beirut. We were expecting in uh, 2014 the United States to bomb. Obama said the red line is a chemical attack and so on. But the bombing didn't happen. And then the Russians intervened in September 2015. They drew a kind of shield around Syria. And the United States had a hard time after that with its policy, you know, staying in the north in certain enclaves, fighting against ISIS was a good distraction to kind of pivot the war away from Damascus and towards ISIS. That was a kind of saving grace for the United States. But the Russian intervention in 2015 in Syria and the seizure of Crimea in 2014 demonstrated to Russia and to people around the world the limits of US and NATO power. It couldn't directly confront um, the Russians. In fact, what message is this sending to China regarding Taiwan, for instance? You know, what if tomorrow um, 25 Chinese bombers fly over Taiwan, land in Taipei Airport, special forces seize the president and they take the island? What happens then? Um, you know, what will the United States do? Will the United States go nuclear? I, I'm not sure. I think the Chinese are watching this. You know, um, uh, 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 Putin actually tested this. He said he called his defense chiefs in and he said, put the nuclear weapons on a high trigger. You know, we're going on to a nuclear alert. Well, that's a big message to the West. You know, you dare to uh, even use an intermediate missile. We're going to come in and fight back and, you know, you can destroy us, but we'll really hurt you. Well, that's a real difference. You know, I mean, I thought after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, after China began to accommodate itself more and more to the West, you know, with Shenzhen and workshop of the world and so on, didn't think there would ever be the possibility of any country confronting Western power in this way. And now we see Russia doing it. And I'm telling you something interesting. That's the reason why in many parts of the South, in particular, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, People are actually cheering on the Russians, not willing to understand the subtleties of what's happening here and all that. It reminds me a lot, Mitch, of the coverage in India, in Africa, in parts of the Middle East from 1904, 1905, uh, you know, when the Japanese defeated the Tsarist army in Port Arthur in that war of 1904, 1905. In places like India, people cheered them on, saying, finally, an Asian power has defeated a European power. They saw Tsarist Russia as a European power. You know, everybody cheered the Japanese on in 1905 in all these you know, countries that had been colonized. 
Now I see very similar things happening regarding Russia. People are saying, oh, good, give the West a little slap because they are so arrogant. They're not looking at the actual issue of Ukraine. And, you know, I don't mean people are being callous, but they are seeing it from that perspective. So we should not ignore that. You know, in India, for instance, not far from my childhood apartment, there's a statue of Lenin. Well, a friend of mine sent me a photograph that a group called the Hindu Sena, these are right wing uh, Hindu organization, far right wing group, put up posters on the Lenin statue's base, which said the following three cheers basically to Mr. Putin for trying to revive the Soviet Union. I mean, <laughs> but what is this? What is this? It's it's crazy times. <laughs> <laughs> Vijay Prashad has been our guest. Vijay Prashad, again, is the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He has a couple of pieces out that you could read about his views on the war in Ukraine, including at the South African newspaper called Mail and Guardian. He has an article called Ukraine, a conflict soaked in contradictions. You can also read his newsletter where he has another piece online at the tricontinental.org. Vijay Prashad, I thank you greatly for taking this time to join us today. Thanks a lot, Mitch.